Hey, so off we go for another one. Uh, thanks everyone for coming back. Uh, you're here in the uh, Joint Force Protection Track and our next presenter is Christian Brost representing ClearSpeed. Uh, before he gets started, just know there is no accommodation for Q&A. Instead, um, Christian will receive a report of everyone who attends this event and that'll enable him to reach out to you all independently uh, and handle things as um, best uh, applicable for the situation. So thanks everyone for your time and attention today. Christian, uh, you've got the stage for 20 minutes. Great, thanks so much. Hey, uh, thanks for having us, everyone. Uh, we we're excited when we saw this uh, come up from, uh, you know, from Trade Win and the Navy, because I think you'll find the way we play in force protection uh, is is pretty neat and pretty different. So, bottom line up front, like any good military briefing. Our technology is a dual use technology. We have military contracts. We use a very similar technology to support commercial clients as well. Our commercial clients are fraud analytics type customers looking to detect fraud and flag fraud and settle claims. Our military customers are typically folks vetting for nationals, screening for force protection. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit more of that as I go through. So we're an AI voice analytics tool that provides risk scoring um, that is meant to be used in parallel to existing data processes and other security measures, right? It's not a pass fail. It's not a credibility assessment um, or voice stress. Uh, we've been through a lot of uh, scientific rigor, as you can imagine. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to be, it, it all kind of kicked off for us with Softworks in 2018, where we identified green on blue threats in Afghanistan. Uh, and from there, um, it's, you know, the SBIR program and the government in general has been uh, very, very good to us. And it's been an amazing relationship. So we started about five years ago, um, doing what I mentioned with Softworks. And we had some early customers who were vetting for nationals for stability operations kinds of things. And, uh, but our product is ready. It's TRL, past TRL level nine. Well, technically TRL level nine is the highest, but we're past that. Uh, but we routinely enhance it, right? And that's what we've been doing. We've been trying to fine tune this so that customer force protection, uh, or military force protection folks love it. It's easy to use and, and they understand what they're getting. So basically we deliver our technology uh, through an automated questionnaire where a simple yes, no response is required. We take that response, we analyze it, we score it from low to high risk based on our algorithm that we built on a whole lot of yes, no responses with known outcomes. So we know what a high risk response looks like we know that model well, we know what a low risk, and we know some variations in between. So high risk scores mean that doesn't mean the person's guilty or is a bad person. It means that something occurred uh, that made them flag for high risk. And, and I'll um, I probably spare the science at this point, but uh, but feel free to talk, talk with me about that um, uh, because I know that's of interest. So Ultimately, we're trying to get folks through a process quickly and swiftly while still lowering the risk or, or risks that can turn into threats, right? So uh, we do this. It's As I mentioned, it's an automated questionnaire. It's over a five-minute phone, phone app uh, or, or phone call or an app experience. So we don't need access to PII and it works in any language, right? Um, you do have to translate the language. So the person understands the questionnaire, but we've actually, uh, put it out into 27 different languages, a little bit of snapshot of who we are. We're based out of California. We're venture back company, uh, $24 million invested. Well, uh, we have a summer series C coming up where we expect uh, at least our series A and B thus far. Uh, we've been deployed in a lot of countries and uh, there's no ITAR restrictions on what we do. We've been very fortunate with our US government customers. We have a new contract kicking off very soon, uh, but we've also been blessed with commercial customers and partners who, who uh, love what we do and use it to, to support the government or support commercial organizations detecting risk and fraud. 
So just to set the stage for the voice market, right? We, we're all dependent on voice. Some folks say the voice is a new frontier. And just to, just to set up where we're at, it, we've all heard, and if you're like me, you use your voice assistant all the time, right? That's natural language processing. Um, so we don't fall into that realm. We also don't fall into the authentication realm, right? My voice is my password. A lot of great banks do it. Um, and that basically associates you to a particular voice or signal pattern. Uh, we don't do emotions, right? Uh, I think there's others that are using emotions for uh, trying to, is it a good time to upgrade a person's insurance plan or whatever else the case may be in a commercial environment. And then of course, there's the, the voice stress. That's where folks are, they're trying to excite people via questions and it's literally that stress that's being detected in what they do and then to the far right of us you have a lot of neat stuff that's been happening with carnegie mellon and some other healthcare companies where they're actually able to to identify parkinson's uh covid whether it's a voice whether it's a cough a voice whatever the case may be but we are squarely in what we call voice forensics for risk identification. So we don't take voice prints. We don't need any personally identifying information. And as mentioned, we work in any language. So that's that narrow sector that we fit into. Here's how it works. Uh, we work with, you know, as I mentioned, commercial and government customers. We talk to them about what are their challenges, what's slipping through security, uh, what their, you know, what their pain is. And based on that, we come up with specific questions uh, that go out to whoever they designate as a population. We come up with three to four yes, no questions that are meaningful and fairly specific. And based on that, uh, a person is given a unique identifier, a number to call or an app to dial into at a particular time. Uh, they do that. We take that yes, no response and we built, we bring it into our universal data model we compare it to our other risk scores. We're using AI and ML to do that again. And then we analyze it. So we put out a risk report that's uh, pretty simple. There's the question, whether the person flagged for high risk or low risk or, uh, or average risk, some other pretty unique attributes on that. And we provide that to customers, right? Uh, so that's how it works. And I'll give you some models here. So. Ultimately, as I walk through the technology, you know, here's where the three to four questions are created. It can be questions, anything involving jeopardy and consequences. Um, so for force protection, it could be questions about past violence, uh, your past in general, extremism, foreign influence, even drug use, right? Even plans for, for, uh, for violence and things like that. From there, the person simply responds yes or no. And again, we analyze that data, we we give it back to the customer, and they they put it into whatever that customer risk management process is, right? Um, there's a lot of sophisticated uh, uh, technologies out there that are doing similar things. Uh, so we're API ready, we're ready to plug in, we'll help the customer integrate, although at the end of the day, everyone's got their own kind of process, how they fit into it. So. We're not meant to replace a process. We're meant to be additive to a process. And here's, here's basically how a lot of our use cases have worked overseas, right? Person consents to uh, a five minute questionnaire. We ask them questions about, you know, are they, are they using mind altering substances? Are they uh, collecting IP or trade secrets? And are they or are they planning to harm American uh, persons or facilities? They give us the response. Again, same as the last one. We analyze it. We hand it back. And we've been able to give a lot of helpful information um, that, you know, I'm happy to talk with you more about. We'd like to think of ourselves as a metal detector, right? With a metal detector, um, you go into an airport and a metal detector isn't going to tell you whether someone's carrying a pen or a pistol. It doesn't know that, right? But what a metal detector does is it triages you and moves you over to the next uh, you know, subject matter expert, or maybe it's the, the scanning machine, whatever the case may be, um, it moves you on to a subject matter expert who 
interacts and investigates further, right? So in the case of a TSA agent, it's a wand, right? To figure out exactly where the metal's located. You pull out your keys or maybe it's a rod in your leg, whatever the case may be, just to verify it's, um, it's something that's not restricted. Well, we're much the same way. We give you an alert. Again, it doesn't mean the person's a bad person. Uh, it doesn't, it's not lie, no lie, but it, what it does mean is that that, that uh, question made their, uh, made their body and memory react in a certain way that flagged, um, that flagged our algorithm based on a whole lot of scientific uh, explanation and background. So, you know, move quickly, uh, move people quickly um, through a system. It doesn't evaluate, you know, what they were intending to do, but it's meant to go fast, right? I mean, we can support up to 10,000 interviews a day between our insurance customers, and that's rapidly improving and our scale continues to grow, but it's non-determinative, like I said before, and there's no bias. We don't know, we don't have any personally identifying information from that person. Uh, so we hand our information, hopefully with a lot of other information to that subject matter expert to investigate further. So what it is, um, you know, when a person accurate or answers a question inaccurately, it affects their speech. And that's exactly what our technology picks up on. You know, we pick up on phonation and resonance aspects of the speech, and then we compare it to our universal risk model. And from there, we're just matching it up and then passing it on as a high or a low risk. So um, we look, as mentioned, we triage from lot high to low, and we use a score. Every single question, which is every topic of interest, is scored accordingly. So you can drill down on exactly, well, what was the reason that person came high risk on mind-altering substances? Um, and so that's for the investigative personnel to decide. What we're not um we don't take voice prints we don't take any kind of biometrics we're not doing voice stress emotions natural language processing which means no bias and uh, a much lighter human touch um so with those attributes uh just to cover our our government business briefly um here's the the first one to the left is what we did in Afghanistan with the at Camp Moorhead with the Afghan National Commando recruits. There was a big challenge at the time with green on blue, right? That's that's when a, a foreign soldier who we train turns their rifle on U.S. troops. Um, based on that, we screened 715 Afghan commandos and we matched 100 percent to the CI and vetting processes that were on out there. Cell phone um, data. They checked all the databases, background investigation, DNA swab, and an interview, and we were the last step. What we found is that we matched 100% of the high-risk people based on our yes-no tool. Um, after that, we identified another group of people that was also not, that wasn't identified by the legacy process. So the customer came back to us because we were disconnected from the tech, running the technology at that time, and they said, hey, what's this other group? What do we do? We're so, just like we said, this is a group of high risk individuals. They need to be investigated further. You need to talk to them. You need to take cues off of things they came up high risk for, and you need to ask questions or, or get other information so you can either uh, prove or disprove um, the high risk. So we did. They're identified. Um, 11 soldiers went AWOL the next day, or excuse me, three soldiers went AWOL and eight of those personnel flagged uh, later the the investigators came back with us and said hey these were these were good hits so the technology worked so again greater than 95 percent accuracy there uh, from there um we had uh, we were sent to camp simba after the al-shabaab attack in 2020 um their challenge is you got foreign persons coming into your base doing all the base necessities, right? Whether it's cooking food, whether it's cleaning linen or uh, whatever the case may be. Well, 
guess what? They just had a they just had an attack. They thought that that was a pretty good threat vector, um, and I I think they had some other insight there too. But bottom line is, what we were able to do is in their native language bring people in through our process and and look and uh, create a, a person of interest list, create people for folks to to look at. We even created a um, an open source hotline where people would actually go through our uh, an open source hotline and and we would analyze their responses uh, to kind of add credence to what they were saying. So as you can see, you know, the folks loved it. Uh, based on that, we've we were chosen as part of a the Air Force supplemental funding contract, which we're about to kick off. That's on the far right. Uh, we're, we'll be doing some neat stuff over in CENTCOM. Uh, SOCOM, they're using us. Uh, their special reconnaissance team one as a unique mission overseas where they're obviously working with a lot of people and those people need to be vetted to make sure that they can uh, trust their insight and their guidance and everything else. So doing a lot there. And we've even worked with uh, the Air Force Security Forces personnel, uh, bringing people on and off base. Um, in some cases, there's folks, uh, foreign nationals who come on base. Sometimes they just want a, a quick screen by someone regarding, um, you know, what their current risk level might be. Despite all the other vetting that happens, we all know that risk is something that can change in a second. And we may or may not know from other data what when those uh, when those dangers can occur. So I know that's a lot, guys. Uh, I appreciate your time. Sorry, I can't answer questions, but here's my information. Uh, I live in Northern Virginia. I'm a, I'm a former Marine veteran, uh, so I love what I do. I love the country and I love the military. So best job in the world. If I can ever answer any questions or uh, give you more information please let me know. And otherwise, it's been a pleasure. Caught me at a refreshment break, Christian. <laughs> Thanks everyone for, for attending. As I mentioned at the, the kickoff, um, Christian will get a, a copy or a report with everyone who attended so he can address any questions you may have for him uh, directly and as well as uh, give him the opportunity to reach out in the most appropriate manner. Um, thanks everyone so much for your attention today. We got one more of these to go. Um, didn't have a whole lot of hiccups today, but you'll hear more about that at the wrap up. Um, we'll see you again here in about uh, seven minutes and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks again. Christian, appreciate having you today. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.